It's now my pleasure to um, start the second half of the show um, and uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Edward Weaver to us. He is a professor in uh, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of Washington. He's co-director of UW Sleep Center and chief of sleep surgery at Harborview. Um, he specializes in sleep surgery, surgical treatment of snoring, my husband I will send to you. Um, and actually my kids were just laughing yesterday because they t were talking about, remember, remember when dad was snoring so loud that he like woke you up and you were screaming at him? So, <laughs> just, and since Terry knows my husband, you can appreciate that. Um, and he's board certified both in um, ENT and uh, sleep medicine. Um, he's associate director of the UW Comparative Effectiveness Cost Outcomes Research Center, expertise in clinical epi and outcomes research, along with um, he treating sleep apnea and snoring, he conducts research on these conditions and the outcomes of treatment. He uh, earned his medical degree at Yale and his master's of public health degree um, at UW Public Health, which is one of the best public health um, graduate departments um, in the country, did his residency um, at Yale and research fellowship with the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at UW. So with that, I introduce you to Dr. Edward Weaver. Thank you very much, Edith, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Julie Collier for inviting uh, Nate and I to uh, present on sleep. Um, we never know when we talk on sleep whether we're going to have an audience full of snoring people. Um, I was, I'm fortunate to be preceded by Nate with this exciting talk. I don't have to make examples out of anyone in my talk. Here's what snoring is, uh, row two, seat number three. <laughs> Acknowledgements, uh, I work at the VA and have had funding from the VA and some of the research I'm going to present is from the VA as well as from NIH. So here are my objectives for the next 40 minutes or so, maybe, yeah, 40 minutes or so, is to try to answer 10 common questions about snoring and sleep apnea. We might not get to them all. Um, if not, um, we'll save them for maybe another year. Um, I want to educate you on snoring and sleep apnea, and then I want to show you a little bit of our research that impacts the clinical practice on management of snoring and sleep apnea throughout the course of these questions. So one common question I get from people who snore is, why do I snore? I'm going to step away from the sort of metaphysical or philosophical reasons why you snore and just go straight to the physiology and the anatomy. So this is a view of looking straight in someone's mouth and in the throat. And if you look in here, uh, there's the uvula. And the soft palate is what it's attached to. And those tissues tend to vibrate. And that's the most common source of snoring. If you look at that same area from a side view, of course, you can breathe through uh, the nose here, but also through the mouth. And it's this tissue vibrating, and commonly when it's vibrating against the back wall of the throat here, that creates the snoring sound. We can look in there with a telescope, which I commonly do in my clinical practice. And here's what it, here's what it looks like and sounds like. So first, I'm going to orient you. We're looking from behind the soft palate down the throat. This in the shadows here, and sorry, the lighting isn't showing it very well, is the voice box. That's where you breathe through. This area here is right behind the soft palate, and that's nice and open. That's a nice big airway. That's the posterior or the back wall of the throat. That's the front wall of the throat. In fact, that's the uvula. So we're right behind the uvula in the throat. And here's uh, what some of you may witness on a nightly basis. <laughs> that's the palate vibrating against the back wall. That's snoring. That's why you snore. It's tissue vibrating. And why does it occur in sleep and not in wake? The main reason is because when we fall asleep, the muscles tend to relax. And everybody gets a little bit of uh, collapsing of the tissues there. Um, but if they're floppy enough or they're already close enough to the back wall, that'll result in um, potential snoring. Incidentally, uh, one commonly cited study cites 44% of men and 28% of women habitually snore. So I know some of you know somebody who snores. <laughs> what are the risk factors for snoring? 
So anatomy is a big one, and I uh, commented on that. Big uvula, floppy palate. There's big tonsils that can also contribute uh, commonly. Position. Some people notice when they sleep on their back, or some people notice when their spouse or their partner sleeps on their back, that they snore, and when they're on their side, they don't. So a little elbow uh, fixes the problem. The breathing pattern can affect snoring. So uh, when one's congested in the nose and is forced to breathe through the mouth, that tends to make snoring more likely. So you get a head cold, you snore, for example. Anything that sedates you tends to make you more prone to snoring, too. So that includes sleep deprivation. So yet another reason not to be sleep deprived is because you'll end up sleep depriving your bed partner with your snoring. Um, alcohol or met certain medications that sedate you all will um, add to snoring. All right, so you snore, or you know someone who snores, and you've seen the ads for snoring treatments. Kind of like Nate in the grocery store picking up O, Oprah's magazine. I look at the catalogs on airplanes <laughs> for uh, snoring treatments, and I often wonder myself, do they work? If you watch late night TV, which you shouldn't do, <laughs> but if you do, you're gonna see advertisements for devices that look like this, like the snore guard and that kind of thing. Those actually can work quite well for snoring, but they gotta be fit appropriately. And what they do is they just hold the jaw forward, which just pulls all the tissues a little bit more out of the way, uh, so it's less likely to, to obstruct or vibrate. Um, we're all Seahawks fans here, right? No. <laughs> you should be snoring right about now, then. And one of our favorite players on the Seahawks is Earl Thomas, right? He's the little torpedo safety. Well, you notice when he plays, he wears a strip that goes over his nose. This isn't Earl Thomas, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a nasal dilator strip, and it helps hold the nose open. Um, uh, that's been proposed for treatment for snoring. In fact, the inventor of the um, Breathe Right strip, the um, most commonly used brand, um, isn't a person in medicine, but a person who snored, who found out when he um, developed this way to hold his nose up, and he didn't snore anymore. There's these inserts you can use, uh, which do the same thing, although they hurt, so most people don't like those. <laughs> so, so those can help some people for snoring. Um, interestingly, there was a study, a really well done study, a randomized trial, randomizing to the dilator, to one of the special pillows, to the throat spray. Okay, let's take a vote of hands. Who thought, versus nothing, who thought the pillow was the best for snoring? Nobody? The spray. The nasal dilator strip. Nothing. You all win. It was a tie. <laughs> they, all, they all didn't work consistently. Um, but, uh, but any of these treatments work for some people. And so um, when people ask me, I just say, um, yeah, it doesn't hurt to give it a try. Now, this is one that was on the airplane catalog uh, called the Breathe, Breathe Easy and Stop Snoring device. <laughs> By touching your septum, which is inside your nose. I don't know how that works. There's no anatomic or physiologic reason that would work. It looks to me like you're putting a plug in your nose, and it only costs $29.95. Here's another one. This one I saw on the way to a sleep meeting, so I quickly took a picture and incorporated it into a talk. Train yourself to stop snoring. This is a little microphone you wear on your wrist, and when it hears a sound, it shocks you. <laughs> It probably works. It's like if you don't have your bed partner give you an elbow, you can just get yourself shot. You won't sleep much and you'll die early, but. <laughs> Tried and true. So, so in all seriousness, what are the treatments for snoring? Uh, fix the snoring factors. So I you know, outlined um, sleep position for some makes a big difference. Uh, clearing nasal congestion by whatever means. That might be as simple as saline spray. It might be as complex as getting surgery if that's necessary. Um, avoiding sedatives, alcohol being the common one. I, you know, I hear all the time, oh, I have, if I have one glass of wine, I don't snore. If I have two, I do snore. And so there's sometimes there's a threshold effect, so know your boundary. Um, so those are simple matters. If it persists beyond that and it's really a problem, then, then typically the treatment is a palate stiffening procedure. Uh, it makes it so it doesn't vibrate as easily. Uh, this is a procedure that can be done in clinic. It's about 60% successful, meaning about 60% of people get to a reduction in snoring that's no longer bothersome. That's how we judge success. It's rare that the snoring is eliminated, but as long as it's not keeping others awake. It can recur. 
We used to think that you know, we could cure snoring, and we now think of it as we manage it, because if it recurs, uh, we sometimes have to retreat. These are pictures of different snoring, uh, stiffening, palate stiffening procedures, either by electricity, by a chemical, or by an implant. They all work by the same method. Um, but sometimes they don't work, and one of the reasons they might not work is sometimes the snoring isn't from the palate. So here's an example. Snore for me. Again. Good. So those tissues on the sides are the tonsils. This person's tonsils are coming in and snoring. Isn't it fascinating how in this person's sleep I could just suggest snoring and they go right to it? There's a hypnotism talk I saw at the mini-med school a few weeks ago and I used that in my clinical practice. <laughs> Here's an interesting one. So this is looking down at the voice box that you couldn't see very well in that previous shadow, but behind here is the voice box. And this stru structure right here is the lid to the voice box. It's called the epiglottis. It's supposed to fall back there like it is right there when you swallow so food won't go down your windpipe. It's not supposed to be there when you're breathing. It's supposed to spring forward. So when it goes to take a breath in, that flops back. Now, this was uh, done without audio, so you can't hear it, but that was the source of snoring for that person, the epiglottis flopping. So you could treat the palate till the cows came home, that person would keep snoring. So sometimes it's not the palate. But the palate, probably 80% of snoring is from the palate. <coughs> All right, here's a third question. My spouse, bed partner, chokes during sleep. Like maybe it's that person, the image I just showed. What's going on there? That's sleep apnea. I'm gonna do a little demo. <laughs> Tell me if you've ever heard this. Okay, get in the zone. If you observe that, you don't have sleep apnea, but the other person does. <laughs> At least they've had one apnea. So that's my segue into sleep apnea. Snoring and sleep apnea are related. They are not necessarily one and the same, but they're related. And they both have to do with constriction or uh, insufficient airflow through the upper airway, meaning between the nose and mouth down into the windpipe. Now this is an upright picture, but if you're lying on your back and gravity's working against you, all the tissues in your mouth can collapse back, meaning the tongue and the palate, and even the sidewalls can collapse in like, like the, the tonsil picture did. So here's uh, an image, uh, a video of a patient who's sedated, so this person's asleep, but they're still breathing on their own or they're trying to. This is called sleep endoscopy. So we do this in the operating room to observe where they're obstructing when they're asleep. I am right now looking at the palate and behind the palate, or I'm trying to look behind the palate, in that first image where there's a big opening that I pointed out, here there's no opening because it's completely obstructed. So a couple bubbles leak out, but that's, that's, their, that's a person's airway. So that video was 10 seconds long. That's how long the obstruction has to last for us to call it an, uh, an, an apnea, for us to define it as an apnea medically. Here's a view further down. That epiglottis that you saw flop back on the one patient, and um, this is the voice box, or just below this is the voice box. This is the tongue, and this is the back wall of the throat. This person's asleep, trying to breathe. And as they go to take a breath in, it all collapses. Then they go to breathe out, it opens. They go to take a breath in, it collapses. So that's a tongue obstruction uh, leading to, to apnea. Those are the two main areas that um, obstruct in sleep apnea, although there's a lot of variations between them and in other spots nearby. We measure sleep apnea with sleep testing. There's an array of different types of sleep testing. 
Uh, the gold standard sleep test is called polysomnography, and that's done in a sleep laboratory being monitored by infrared video camera uh, with a sleep technologist watching on a monitor um, with a whole variety of measurements. So EEG measuring brain waves, um, uh, EOG measuring eye movements, chin uh, muscle tone, uh, measuring airflow, measuring oxygen level on a finger probe, measuring respiratory effort, and potentially other measurements as well. Nate alluded to uh, some of these measurements in his um, depictions of uh, uh, sleep staging and so forth. The definition of the condition, obstructive sleep apnea, this is a working definition. Recurrent upper airway obstructions during sleep. Each word there is um, fundamental in the definition, so they have to happen over and over for it to be the condition of sleep apnea. If they have one apnea in the night, that's not sleep apnea. That normally happens to people if you were to watch them the whole night, um, or it's not abnormal to have those occasionally. Upper airway means the area from the windpipe to the mouth and nose, that's obstructive sleep apnea. If they're not breathing for a different reason, it's not obstructive sleep apnea. It's obstructions, and it only occurs during sleep. And the reason it occurs during sleep is because when we sleep, the muscles relax. And another key thing that happens when we sleep is there's a reflex when we're awake that naturally tightens the muscle tone enough to breathe. So when I show you some images of people with really narrow airways when they're awake, that's enough to breathe. The problem is as soon as they fall asleep, it doesn't have much to collapse before it's completely obstructed. And so we rely on that during our exam, awake exam, to determine someone who's vulnerable to the apneas. A more uh, technical definition of obstructive sleep apnea is an apnea hypopnea index greater than five, or greater than or equal to five. What that means is they have apneas and hypopneas. Apnea is a 10 second cessation of airflow, basically no airflow for 10 seconds. A hypopnea is 10 seconds of decreased airflow. And there's other caveats to the definition that I won't get into for technical reasons. The apnea hypopnea index is the number of apneas and hypopneas one has per hour of sleep on average through the night. So if you're having five or more of those per hour, that's sleep apnea, and that's in the mild range. If it's 15 or more, it's moderate sleep apnea. If it's 30 or more, it's called severe sleep apnea. Recent updated statistics on the prevalence of sleep apnea are um, concerning. Uh, 10 to 17 percent of men and 3 to 9 percent of women, adult men and women, have moderate or severe sleep apnea. All right, next question I get from patients after they see the video, it looks bad. Or I get this from the spouse who's accompanying the patient who's watching their spouse or bed partner look like they're going to die repeatedly every night. It looks bad. Is it bad? And the answer to that is it depends. Um, if it's severe sleep apnea, it can be really bad. So this is a patient from the sleep center. Uh, uh, our sleep center, Harborview Medical Center. Um, this is uh, a broader view of a hypnogram. Uh, Nate alluded to the hypnogram describing the sleep stages here on the top level. This is a summary of a number of the variables measured on that polysomnography of the overnight sleep test. The next line here are each tick mark is an apnea or a hypopnea. The red ones are apneas, so he's having almost all apneas, so they're almost all complete obstructions. They're all lasting uh, about 30 to 40 seconds long and he's having them basically continuously through the night. Now, if you're astute, you'll notice that he's not having any right here. And the magic there is, he's awake. <laughs> it's sleep apnea. So, uh, too bad we didn't like figure out, oh, there's something we could do to fix him. Yeah, we can keep him awake. But then you get in trouble with Nate, so that's not a solution. Um, so a few things I want to point out on here is um, there's a lot of a lot going on here, and I want to highlight first the sleep stages. So Nate showed you the natural progression of sleep, which you go from wake quickly to stage one sleep, pretty quickly to stage two sleep, then to stage three sleep, and then you spend quite a bit of time in stage three sleep, and then eventually you get to REM sleep. Usually it's about an hour, hour and a half into your sleep time. So this patient has no N3 sleep and no REM sleep for the first half of his night. N3 sleep is the one that restores body that Nate alluded to. REM sleep is the one that helps memory consolidation and we think uh, restores mind. Um, he's getting none. And this poor sleep leads to the adverse daily effects that make sleep apnea bad. 
Those daily effects, day-to-day -day effects of sleep apnea include the symptoms, snoring being one of them. So snoring is a symptom of sleep apnea. Not everyone who snores has sleep apnea, but pretty much everyone who has sleep apnea snores. Disturbed sleep, restless sleep, difficulty sleeping, insomnia, or difficulty waking. Morning headache, morning throat discomfort, those are common symptoms. Daytime sleepiness is a very common symptom. Daytime fatigue, there's subtle differences between those two, but they're related. In kids, sleepiness oftentimes results in hyperactivity. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is associated with sleep apnea in kids. They get hyperactive, then they crash. Now, that doesn't make sense. But here's something else that doesn't make sense. We treat hyperactivity with a stimulant, and it works. Ritalin is a stimulant, and it works. And the reason it works is it's counteracting the sleepiness that the child is experiencing so that they don't have the behavioral manifestation as hyperactivity. Adults, usually when they're sleepy, they don't get hyperactive, they get hypoactive, and they sleep or nap, like Thomas Edison. Uh, mood swings, irritability, even uh, clinical depression. These are all symptoms. Snoring and daytime sleepiness are by far and away the most common ones that we see, but all of these we see readily as well. Here's another day-to-day -day effect of obstructive sleep apnea. That poor sleep is basically sleep deprivation. Uh, it's, it's like the person who didn't sleep for 24 straight hours and gets in a car. And um, so there's been studies on sleep apnea risk for driving. This is one from Sweden, uh, one that I think is um, a, a really good one. They control, they had a, a group of sleep apnea patients and they compared them to matched controls, same age, same sex, and they corrected for driving exposure and then over a five-year period they tabulated the number of single car accidents. And the sleep apnea patients had an almost tenfold greater risk of single car accidents than the patients, the people who didn't have sleep apnea. And the single car accidents are a sign of sleepy accidents. Those are the ones where you drift off the road. So that's a day-to-day -day effect of sleep apnea. <clears throat> Here's another feature of his sleep test I wanted to show you. This is um, uh, his oxygen levels. So oxygen should be between 90 and 100% all the time. Um, his goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. It's like a total sawtooth. And if we were to expand out the time scale, you'd see it going up and down. Instead, it just looks like a really thick line. And sometimes it goes down to almost 50%. So that's severely abnormal. That's bad for you. And probably the lowest low isn't what's the worst for you. What's really bad for you is the up and down, up and down, the fluctuation oxygen level. It leads to a phenomenon called oxidative stress, and that has many adverse medical effects. Not just from sleep, sleep apnea is not the only cause of oxidative stress, there's other causes of that, but um, it leads to a variety of medical effects. And it's not, the leading thinking now is that it's this uh, intermittent hypoxia that um, drives a lot of the adverse long-term medical effects uh, related to sleep apnea. Cardiovascular disease being the most uh, well-studied and clearly um, associated. Stroke, diabetes, um, and even recent publications on cancer both increased incidence of cancer as well as increased risk of metastases from cancer. And then death. I'm gonna share a little bit of data on death. These are data from a Wisconsin sleep cohort study. This is a longitudinal study that's been going on for about two decades now where um, they screen for sleep apnea state workers in the state of Wisconsin. So it's not a medical population, it's just a community population and they've been following for years. Uh, most of the people did not get treated. They weren't being seen by a clinical facility. They were just told that they had a diagnosis when they enrolled in this research study and were and diagnosed, but most did not end up getting treated. And they were just followed for a variety of conditions, including death. And um, based on the severity, mild, or no sleep apnea, mild, moderate, and severe, over, a, uh, looks like it went out about 18 years, there's a stratifying effect of severity of sleep apnea on your survival, depicted on the y-axis here. So, but at 18 years, less than 60% of the severe sleep apnea patients were still alive. So is it bad? Yes, if it's symptomatic, or if it's, especially if it's severe. And some would argue moderate or severe should really drive uh, uh, concern uh, for long-term health. Mild sleep apnea is more controversial. It's very subtle long-term health risks with mild sleep apnea. Question five. I heard it is due to being overweight. I'm not, but I have apnea. Sounds like Terry's son. Um, why? 
I get this question about every other time I'm in the operating room because when I operate on patients with sleep apnea, a lot of times they're not uh, very obese people. Uh, for them, surgery typically isn't a real good option, and everyone thinks that sleep apnea is only due to obesity, but it's not. Um, so there are other factors, and multiple factors, anatomy again being a key one. Now body weight affects the anatomy, and the excess body weight, in fact, affects the upper airway anatomy specifically. I'm going to show a, a quick study on that. Um, but there are many other anatomical factors, like big tonsils, big tongue, long palate, small jaw, which means you have less space for all those tissues, small upper jaw. Um, these are all factors that can play into sleep apnea. In fact, probably are more important than obesity in and of itself. Body position, again, lying on the back tends to make sleep apnea worse. Breathing pattern, again, like snoring. If you mouth breathe, it tends to make sleep apnea worse. Sedation, again, like snoring, tends to make sleep apnea worse. And weak muscle tone, whether it's a condition, like Down syndrome, is a condition where uh, there's a weak muscle tone, they tend to have really bad sleep apnea. Um, uh, uh, age is another uh, uh, factor that's gonna weaken muscle tone and maybe a reason why uh, sleep apnea tends to become more prevalent with age. Here's an interesting study, not done by me. This was done by a group at University of California, San Diego. They looked at cadavers, specifically cadaver tongues. And um, they associated the body mass index of those people before they died and the amount of, the percentage of fat in their tongue. And they found a correlation between um, the amount of, uh, the body mass index and the percent of fat in the tongue. And in particular, the back of the tongue, the part of the tongue that's in the throat, had uh, the strongest correlation. So probably the excess body weight is related to sleep apnea, we think, probably because you have extra fat deposition in the tongue and your tongue gets bigger. So it's really an anatomic problem. Um, it's just um, enhancing the abnormal anatomy there in the tongue. So here's what that might look like. This is, this is the view I was hoping you were seeing in the very first um, video. This is um, a normal voice box. This is that epiglottis that's supposed to be sprung open so that you can see the vocal cords and the airway. This is what a person with a really large tongue looks like, whether it's by fat or just because they have a big tongue. The epiglottis is pushed back. This is what the person's breathing through. This image is from an awake person breathing normally. You only need that much, but you can imagine as soon as they fall asleep, that's gonna shut off pretty quickly. Here's a normal, relatively normal exam looking just straight into a mouth. The tongue is down here. You can see the back wall of the throat. The uvula is not too big. And I look at, when I do an exam, I look at the dimension going up and down, side to side, and front to back behind the palate. So here's an abnormal one, long palate, uh, narrowed in the direction, so there's a narrow lateral opening, there's tonsils embedded in here. Um, here's the best way to look at behind the palate, so it's with a telescope, again, nice and open one, so that I can see the voice box from way up here to one that's very narrow. Here's another way to tell if someone's got a nice space behind their palate. If they can do this, it's adequate. Okay. And if you can look with the telescope through the nose and see their tongue in their nose, that's open enough. They don't need any work. Actually, he's a person I had operated on, so I think I did a good job. That's why I measured my success. All right, sir, let's see how well we did. Stick your tongue up behind your nose. Uh, he volunteered to do it. I didn't make him do it. He said, look what I can do. I said, can I, do you mind if I video that? <laughs> Let me get one in your nose and your mouth at the same time. Uh, that was a long clinic visit. <laughs> Position can affect it. So sitting upright, here's this person. I would, I would argue this is not totally normal, uh, but I can see part of the airway, and then here's that same person awake but lying down, and you can see the tongue has fallen back further and, and narrowed it further. This person's vulnerable to sleep apnea just from position. Even mouth opening can have that effect in some people. So when you open your mouth, your jaw swings back a little bit, and some people it really pushes the tongue back quite a way. So this is a person awake uh, with the mouth closed and then with their mouth open. So you think, oh, when I exercise, you need to get more air, I should open my mouth to breathe. The difference there is when you're awake, the reflexes intact will pull the tongue out of the way enough for you to get enough air. So it's a bigger inlet than your nose, and the fact that it's smaller in your throat doesn't matter because your muscle will tighten. When you're asleep, you lose that reflex. So if you open your mouth to breathe when you're asleep, Sometimes, in some people, it really hurts their ability to breathe. 
So nasal obstruction can have an indirect effect on sleep apnea in the throat. And sometimes it's floppy tissue. This is that same epiglottis I'd shown you before. What can be done about it? There's some conservative therapies. So getting adequate sleep so that you're not sleep deprived because sleep deprivation and sedation makes it worse. Have consistent sleep schedule. That also helps. Avoid sedatives, alcohol being the um, uh, 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 common culprit. Sleep position. For some people, just sleeping off their back will alleviate their sleep apnea. For some people, they only have sleep apnea when they're on their back. We can see that on the sleep test because one of the measurements we make is whether they're on their back, on their side. And when we see that pattern, one of the recommendations commonly is uh, strategies to keep off your back. Throat exercises. There are a couple of publications suggesting that throat exercises might help. Um, either speech language pathology, sort of like voice exercise type throat exercises, um, or, or another one that I'm going to allude to in a second. The problem with all these strategies is there's actually very little data on these. I know of one good study on sleep position. I know of two studies that are good on throat exercises. I'm not sure I've actually seen a study on sleep hygiene, but it makes good common sense because we know that sleep deprivation tends to make it worse. And none of these is risky. So we readily recommend all these uh, approaches. So the other throat exercise is the didgeridoo. Uh, I don't know if anyone heard about this article. It was about five or six years ago. It came out in the British Medical Journal, which is a big time journal. They had people who wanted to learn to play the didgeridoo. They randomized them to either one half who gets to start the didgeridoo now, or the other half that has to wait six months before you get to start the didgeridoo. And they had sleep apnea, too. And they monitored their sleep apnea. And after six months of playing didgeridoo versus not playing didgeridoo, the didgeridoo players had a, a measurable improvement in their sleep apnea. <laughs> now, the didgeridoo is a long aboriginal horn. It takes a lot of effort to blow the horn, and it requires circular breathing. So you breathe in through your nose while you're ex blowing out of your mouth, and then you fill your mouth, and I don't even know how you do this, but <laughs> it requires coordination and muscle tone. So I was in Australia giving uh, some sleep talks, uh, that a colleague asked me to come do, and I'm hanging out by um, the, uh, the harbor in Sydney, and there's this guy out there playing a didgeridoo. It was right after that article came out. So when he was taking his, he was selling CDs. When he's, when he's doing his break, I, I bought a CD <laughs> so, so I could learn how to play didgeridoo, and asked me if he'd take a picture in case I'm ever given a talk where I have to talk about the didgeridoo. He said, yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> so here's the aboriginal didgeridoo player. I told him about this study. He wasn't very impressed. I don't think he had sleep apnea. <laughs> weight loss. Uh, obesity is a major risk factor for sleep apnea, and weight loss improves sleep apnea. And the good news is do you get a bigger bang for your buck at the initial weight loss, which is great because people you know, who, who are obese, have, all of them have tried to lose weight. So when they come to our clinic and we just say you should lose weight, that, that's meaningless. They've gone through so many efforts to try to lose weight. But a little motivational speaking can help because for the, for the first 10% of excess body weight the person loses, they get a 30% effect on their sleep apnea on average. So you get like a threefer on that first 10%. And one of the biggest reasons people have a hard time keeping weight off with diet and exercise alone is because as soon as you have a setback, it's so easy to just say, what the heck, you know, and, and, and give in. But if you remember, hey, wait a second, I'm getting a threefer. For that little bit that I, I hadn't hit my target yet, but I'm getting a threefer for this it might allow people to at least lose um, some little bit of weight, and every little bit makes a big difference. It turns out the same is true for diabetes. Diabetes risk has a disproportional improvement in the first part of the weight loss. The bad news is, even if you lose all the excess body weight down to ideal body weight, most of the time the sleep apnea is not gone. So patients who get surgery for weight loss, um, it usually helps the sleep apnea a lot if they have sleep apnea, but usually there's residual about moderate severity sleep apnea. Sustained weight loss is difficult. We do not wait for weight loss before we embark on other treatments, especially in the setting of moderate severe sleep apnea. There are no medications for sleep apnea that really do much of anything. And the mainstay of treatment is positive airway pressure, CPAP, or variations called BiPAP, AutoPAP. Has anyone heard of CPAP? For those who didn't raise your hand, have you heard of the machine or the mask? Those are all terms, interchangeable terms. The CPAP is a pneumatic splint. The way it works is it puts air pressure in there so that the tensity to collapse can't happen because there's air pressure. And the pressure is set specific to an individual, so it's actually titrated to the amount of pressure they need to hold their airway open. 
and it works really well. It, it holds the airway open, and um, uh, I'm going to show you an example of that. This is what it looks like. It's a little air compressor. It sits on the nightstand. It has a little heated humidifier in there to keep the air humidified, which is good for the nose, and then it attaches to the nose preferentially. Here's what it would look like on a person. There's some straps holding it in place, but there's all kinds of different mask configurations to try to um, achieve maximum comfort for any given individual. And this is what we look for with the CPAP, that their mouth is closed, that they're able to sleep comfortably with it on. So this is that patient with severe sleep apnea I showed before. Really bad oxygen desaturations, having apneas continuously. His sleep stages are just, he, he's not getting any real sleep. Here's what he looked like just starting the CPAP. So here's the CPAP lead. He's starting off at the lowest level. He's still having some oxygen desaturation, still having some apnea, still getting some um, disruptive sleep. But as the CPAP is ramped up, he now gets some N3 sleep. Ah. And then he gets some REM sleep early. In fact, this is a little earlier than normal, probably because he's making up for a lost REM sleep in the whole rest of his previous life. Um, he's having very few apneas and so forth. And so this is what CPAP can do. It has an immediate physiologic uh, near abolishment of the sleep apnea. It controls symptoms really well. It improves quality of life. There's studies showing all these outcomes. It reduces motor vehicle accidents, it reduces risks of medical uh, complications, long-term of sleep apnea, and improved survival. The caveat is it only works if you use it. And the more you use it, the more it works. So this is a study showing that um, uh, sleepiness measured subjectively, quality of life related to sleep, and sleep me sleepiness measured objectively all increase your likelihood of having a normal amount of each of these the more you use a CPAP. Two, two to four, four to five, five to six, six to seven, seven to eight. For some of these outcomes, four hours might be enough where you start to see a plateau, for example, in subjective sleep. However, objective sleep, it looks like you need about six or seven hours, and for quality of life, same, six or seven hours. So it probably depends on which outcome, on how much CPAP you need for it to be considered uh, enough. Um, typically, the more, the better. Um, and improved survival. This is a study we did at the VA. We looked at, um, 116,000 patients who had a diagnosis of sleep apnea but no documented treatment, and the VA does documentation of treatment really well. Um, they know what you've had. Now, one of the treatments is CPAP. They know if you got a CPAP machine. They don't know if you're using it, but they know if you got it. And if you got a CPAP machine, your survival was much improved compared to if you were untreated for sleep apnea over a 12-year period in this study. The difficulty with CPAP is, some people have a hard time accepting it and tolerating it. It's cumbersome, it has side effects, um, there might be social issues, if the person has panic attacks or claustrophobia, there's a variety of issues that might interfere with a person's ability to use it. Um, there's strategies to try to overcome those things, um, but the bottom line is, are they using it adequately or not? So the question I get in my clinic, because I treat patients who have a hard time with CPAP, what are the alternatives to the mask? There's two main alternatives other than the conservative measures I mentioned earlier. One is a jaw advancement splint. That holds the jaw forward with a device in the mouth. And by holding the jaw forward, you pull the jaw forward, you pull the tongue and the other related soft tissues forward. It just helps pull them out of the way. And for some people, it works very well. They have to have adequate teeth to hold the splint. And there's some potential side effects of the splint. It doesn't work in all cases, but um, it's a well-established uh, uh, alternative treatment. And then um, it, and there's studies showing that it controls symptoms, improves quality of life, reduces accidents, reduces medical complications, improves survival. It does all those things. It's less effective than CPAP when someone's wearing their CPAP, but it's better tolerated than CPAP. And so in some studies in, in the clinical outcomes, in fact, a recent one on high blood pressure, it was a wash because the oral plants patients used theirs more, the CPAP patients had a bigger effect when they used it. And so, um, so it's a really important option for someone who's not able to use their CPAP enough. Surgery is another option, that's what I do. Um, sleep surgery are procedures to open and stabilize the upper airway to facilitate breathing, snoring, or sleep apnea. It's a broad array of procedures. Often they're combined, some procedures have to be staged, and often surgery is combined with CPAP or jaw splint or any of the other treatments. In fact, all of these treatments can be combined in different patterns, so it's not any single isolated treatment. In fact, the, the key to managing sleep apnea in today's world is it's multidisciplinary and you have expertise in all these different treatments because they might all come into play in, in certain individuals. Sleep surgery um, 
Uh, if you get on the web and look at sleep surgery, you're going to find like two or three procedures, and that ends up being um, the definition of sleep surgery in some people's minds, but that's not what it is. So um, I wanted to highlight the combination feature. So here's a sample of nasal airway surgeries. This is far from an exhaustive list. Here's a sample of pharynge upper pharyngeal surgeries near the palate and the uh, tonsils. Um, here's one of them. This is called uvulopatal flap. This is uh, the patient I showed with a long palate with narrow uh, palatal inlet. And then this is a surgery where we um, folded the palate up on itself to open the dimensions uh, of the airway. This is after they healed. Here's another example. This is a patient who's trying to use CPAP. The highest the CPAP pressure goes is 24 centimeters water pressure. He was on 24 and he still had severe sleep apnea. Here's why. He has these large obstructing masses in his throat. So this is his lips. This is a close-up of a mouth. This is a retractor holding his mouth open. This is actually during surgery. This is his tongue being pushed out of the way by the retractor. Here's his uvula. It was long, so I had to fold it up out of the way so you could see his tonsils. So those are extra large. I remove them. You don't know how satisfying that is. Like, those do not belong in there. I will remove them. And then I'll measure them. I have to tell a quick anecdote. So I was just reading, like, the Sunday paper, and it was talking about the Guinness Book of World Records, and it talked about the largest tonsils in the Guinness Book of World Records. I think they're smaller than these. I was, like, I, was, I was like, I should submit the tonsils that I'm taking out for the Guinness Book of World Records. Wouldn't that be cool? I haven't gotten around to it. If the word gets out, probably there's going to be really big tonsils getting in the world book, Guinness Book of World Records. So this is what this patient looks like right after surgery. Now you can see the back wall of his throat. This patient's not cured of his sleep apnea. He has really bad sleep apnea. The purpose of that tonsillectomy was actually to enable him to use CPAP. So that if he had 24 centimeters of water pressure, he wouldn't still have severe sleep apnea. And hopefully he gets below 24 centimeters, he can have 15 centimeters of water pressure. So I didn't do an aggressive surgery, I just took off part of the evil and took out the tonsils. Here's a sample of lower pharyngeal surgeries. I'll show a couple examples. This is called a lingual tonsillectomy. Some people don't know this, but there's actually tonsils further down your throat, on the very bottom of your tongue, right where it meets your voice box. And they can get in the way. So here's the person, who has a really big lingual tonsil. Um, I took it out and measured it, too. <laughs> and then here's the patient right afterward. Nice open space there. This is the breathing tube that they have in place while um, in surgery. Here's a related procedure. Uh, this is a close-up view, similar view. So this is a depressor pushing the tongue up out of the way. So the person's upside down. They're lying on their back. And this thing's pushing their tongue up out of the way. Here's the breathing tube coming in from behind, from their nose. Here's their teeth, upper teeth. And here's a piece of tongue with a little um, retractor I'm using to hold it. And I'm actually dissecting out a chunk of tongue. I, I like to measure these things when I take them out. Like, see how long it is, see how heavy it is. Because <laughs> it doesn't belong in there and it's taking up space, valuable space. So here's the tissue we removed. And um, here's this person before the surgery. This was awake in the clinic before we had done the surgery. You can see that it's kind of narrow here behind the voice box. The epiglottis is pushed back. And then here's the patient. Um, uh, after they've healed. And so this is, you know, where we've taken all this tissue out. It's no longer pushing the epiglottis back. You can now actually see their normal larynx and their normal voice box. Another procedure we do is genoglossus advancement. That's where we pull the tongue forward. We take advantage of the fact that the key part of the back of the tongue is attached to a small spot on the front of the jawbone right behind here. So we can make a little window in the jawbone, grab that attachment, and pull it through. Here's what it looks like in surgery. So we've cut... It's far enough away from dinner that... I'm glad nobody's snoring, because the... so uh, it's called gene gloss advance. It heals, and it helps pull things out of the way. There's global airway surgeries where we actually pull the whole jaw, upper jaws forward. Now, some patients come to my clinic and say, I heard surgery doesn't work, but does it work? And they've heard about like one surgery, one isolated procedure. So this is the last question I'm going to answer, because I only have two questions. Oh, man. Uh, the, an the short answer is, it depends on what you mean by it and work. If by it you mean the comprehensive surgery and use the options appropriately dictated by the anatomy, yes, it works. If you mean cure, it doesn't cure, but if you mean improve symptoms, quality of life, accidents, risk of medical complications, and survival, it works. In fact, it works the same or even better than some of the other treatments if they're not using them adequately. In fact, I'm going to show you 
One quick study of that. This is quality of life, but this is a study on survival I showed earlier. Here's the patients who got just actually a, a palate surgery for sleep apnea. This is severe sleep apnea, in fact. So it probably didn't completely treat their sleep apnea. But the patients who received a CPAP were better than no treatment. The patients who re received a UPP were better than the patients who received a CPAP on average. It's not that UPP is better than CPAP, it's that some people weren't using their CPAP. The people who used their CPAP had an even better outcome. The point is, yeah, surgery absolutely can be helpful in the right situation under the right application. Sorry we didn't get to question number nine and 10, but that leaves an opportunity for the future. <laughs> Thank you. That was so fabulous.